Okay, so on to the agenda. So we're going to have a qu quick talk about what ZFS you know, does, what are the sort of underpinning things that make it different from everything else. We'll have a look at how ZFS's um, storage pools work as opposed to just traditional file systems. And then we'll have a quick look at some of the advanced features that ZFS has. Okay, so ZFS originally stood for the Zettabyte file system. Um, in actual fact, the Zettabyte in that doesn't mean anything. ZFS is capable of storing a hell of a lot more than a Zettabyte, um, which is quite a big amount. Um, so it now doesn't stand for anything, it's just ZFS. Um, one of the engineers that goes around um, Southern UK and talks about uh, ZFS, he actually calls it the Zebedee file system. Um, to de demonstrate the fact that it really doesn't matter what the hell you call it, it's just ZFS. All of his demo materials have pictures of the, you know, the spring from, you know, this tomato in a spring from the magic roundabout. It's kind of strange. Um, so that's the reasoning behind the name. What it is, is an integrated file system and volume manager. So in addition to just, you know, storing the bits and bytes that make up your files and folders on a disk, it also handles your disks, so it can combine disks and so on and so forth, same way as software RAID works or a hardware RAID controller. Um, because of that, it actually obsolates all of those three technologies that you see there. Hardware RAID doesn't, you know, there's no, there's not many uses for it out if you're if you're using ZFS. Um, volume managers, ZFS is a volume manager, so you don't need one. And traditional file systems. Basically, there isn't a, a file system around that can really hold a candle to ZFS as a general purpose file system. Obviously, things like you know, distributed file systems are a little bit different. Um, but if you look at the Lustre data sheet on there, you can see how Sun talks about that kind of stuff too. So it's a 128-bit address space, so that's four quadrillion billion addresses. Um, I think I've seen somewhere in one of the materials that that's actually more atoms than there are in the universe. Or something along those lines. It's some you basically you're never going to run out of space as far as addressing is concerned with ZFS. And the whole thing of ZFS, you know, the whole code, the whole um, way you build it into a, an operating system, all that stuff is open source under the CDDL, which is some sort of open source license. It's part of Open Solaris project, so folk can just grab it. And as a result of this. Um, Open Slars obviously supports ZFS, and it's the place where all the ZFS development really goes on, and where you're going to get the latest, best version. There's experimental support in FreeBSD 7. Um, they were the first people to really sort of take ZFS and go, "Oh, cool, we'll have that." Um, as I've already mentioned, um, Apple do have plans to to get ZFS really worked into um, Mac OS 10, and I'm pretty sure that they are doing read write for Snow Leopard, which is the next version of OS uh, 10, but it's going to be on the server edition only, so you won't see it on your desktop. I would imagine that's because they need to spend some time on the consumer version and making some wizzy GUIs with stars and things like that. Linux is the big one. Everyone wants to get ZFS onto Linux, and there is a problem with that in that because Linux is licensed under the GPL, that means you can't actually build ZFS into it because ZFS is licensed under the CDDL and GPL explicitly forbids bit linking against incompatible um, sources. So you can't actually build ZFS into the Linux kernel um, because you know, the GPL just doesn't allow it. Um, there's all sorts of uh, discussions as to whether or not that's you know, Sun's fault for not adopting the GPL or whether it's the GPL's fault for being so damn restrictive. So to get around that, what you can do is you can use a user land implementation through the Fuse project. So what the Fuse project does is it allows you to implement file systems that just run as a program, as opposed to being part of the operating system built into the kernel. And there's all sorts of interesting file systems you can get. For example, you can do an SSH FS through Fuse, which basically uses SSH to connect to another system. And then you can just create a file system through that SSH connection that just looks like a normal file system. It's kind of cool. ZFS is another system that can be supported through that. But since ZFS's real power is in the fact that it goes right from the disks all the way up to the top of the file system layer, you're not really getting the full benefit of ZFS if you use it like that. Okay, so what makes ZFS different? Well, ZFS makes use of something called count. 
Now, that silly, that's not what cow is all about. Um, cow, in terms of ZFS, actually means copy on write. Um, what that means is that everything that you do in ZFS is atomic. Everyone comfortable with what the term atomic means in, in this context? I need some shaking heads to tell me I need to explain what atom atomic means. I'm seeing, I'm seeing some glazed looks. If, if something's atomic, that means it's a single operation that's either done or it's not done. So, in a traditional file system, if you've got a file, so say for example that um, blue dot, oh sorry, the blue square up there is a file, and the little yellow dots underneath are the blocks that contain that file's data. What you normally do in a traditional file system, if you want to overwrite that data, maybe you want to update the file, you would then just write the data into the block. So that's what's happened there with the, the little orange one. So what happens if you lose power halfway through writing that block? Obviously you've got a problem there because half your data is written, half your data is not written. And if you've got stuff like you know, parity, if, you're, if you've got a hardware read array, for example, and it's calculating parity and things like that, you could actually end up with an inconsistent file system. And that's why if you use uh, systems, file systems like X3 and so forth, if you kill the um, uh, operating system without safely shutting it down, you boot back up and suddenly you have to run um, FSCK or something like that to make sure that your file system is in a consistent state. ZFS doesn't do that. ZFS doesn't have that problem because everything that it does is atomic. So what it does is, instead of just writing over the data in place, it writes to a new block, it gets all the data there. Now that's not in the file system yet because nothing's pointing at it. And then in a single operation, it changes the pointer in the file descriptor, or sorry, the file inode, to point at the new data. So that's, that's good because that means if, you're, if you get perfectly halfway through reading this, sorry, writing this block, it doesn't matter because the original data is still saved. Now everything in ZFS does this. Um, when you're updating an inode, when you're creating uh, new files, when you're you know, calculating parity, everything in ZFS is based around copy on write semantics. And what that gives you is a real confidence that if you lose power, you're not going to suddenly have your file system in an inconsistent state. Now in addition to that, everything in ZFS is checksummed. It's got a 256-bit hash for every block that's written to the disk. Now that is important because you need, to, you need to be able to know when you've written some data to disk that when you read it back, that data is the same data that you, you wrote. There's all sorts of things that can cause data corruption. You can, you know, there may be a problem with the, um, the cabling or the controller in between you and the disk. Maybe the disk has some bad sectors on the, um, the magnetic uh, platters. It can even, you can even get something called bit rot, which has absolutely really screwed me over, actually. I've, I've got a server on which I keep a lot of uh, movie files, which are all totally legal. I haven't downloaded them from the internet or anything. Um, the problem is, if you don't read them for a very, very long time, like a period of a couple of years, the magnetic charges in the disk lose their charge, and you actually end up with corruption in your data because you've lost some of the information because the charges get too weak to register as a bit. So even just not reading data for a while can cause your data to get corrupted. So you want some way of detecting that. Now, at that time, I had that data stored on an NTFS partition, Windows which meant that, you know, that was it. You know, those files were corrupted, I had to rewrip them, which is a pain in the neck when you've already gone through the pain of writing them. ZFS can tell you when you've got corruption. Um, because it's end-to-end, -end, what it does is it calculates the, the, um, the checksum before it writes the data, and then when it reads back the data, it then calculates the data that it's read. So instead of having, like, you know, your hardware read controller calculating checksums and parity and stuff like that, and then maybe something goes wrong while the data is winging its way from the hardware RAID controller into your operating system and you get corruption that you don't detect. ZFS is fully end-to-end. -end. So if you get data back from ZFS and it doesn't say, ah, I'm, I'm broken, you know that you've got the same data that you wrote to the disk. Um, if you then take um, ZFS's RAID-like abilities, you can then repair the data automatically. So as long as ZFS doesn't tell you, um, oh, I've got a problem and I can't repair it, you know you've got your data.